Hello, Booktube. Welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and this is the History Trail tag. So Peg over at the History Shelf, uh, she was kind enough to um, to tag me <laughs> uh, for this tag, uh, revolving around history and experiencing history and reading history. Uh, and thank you, Peg. Um, you know, uh, for doing that, please check out her video. It's the history shelf. I'll have a link below. Uh, she is an excellent resource for uh, different nonfiction historical books. Um, and every time she makes a video, my my TBR gets more and more bloated. Um, but uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go going through um, going through these different questions. Uh, learn a little bit about my my historical experience. Some stuff that inspired me. Um, some of my preferences, some of my recommendations. Uh, you know, history has always been um, a big part of my life. Uh, I always loved learning about history growing up. I um, teach history. I teach middle school social studies. Uh, I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in history. Um, of course, that doesn't make me an expert <laughs> in anything. Um, I'm still really an enthusiast, but, uh, you know, I can read some of the more, of course, academic stuff. I know how to write a paper. Um, so, <clears throat> with that in mind, uh, we'll begin with the first question on this tag. Uh, it is, first steps, what book, movie, person, place, like, all those are included, I guess, introduced you to history or historical fiction? Uh, and first I will say that, you know, I, I am much more on the nonfiction history side. Uh, I, I don't have a ton of experience with historical fiction. That is one of the things that uh, in the future I do want to change and start reading more historical fiction. Uh, although there was some historical fiction that certainly was an influence on me. Um, so one of the first, um, one of the early books that really got me, uh, and I had just spoken about this recently on my um, middle grade TBR, um, middle grade March TBR video that I did. And that's uh, The Man Who Was Poe. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of a, you know, children's historical fiction, uh, takes place in Baltimore in the mid 1800s. Uh, this boy has his, uh, his sister's kidnapped and he ends up basically recruiting Edgar Allan Poe, um, you know, who's dealing with his own, own issues and demons, uh, to help him try to solve the mystery. Um, but it was books like this that definitely had a big effect on me. Um, <clears throat> another thing that really affected me, and I don't think a lot of people think of this when they think of history, and that's one of the things in my channel that I keep kind of driving home, and I think it might be a certain theme that I've returned to and that wasn't planned when I started this channel, but that is, um, yeah, ghost stories. Um, I know some people will recognize these scholastic books, um, that I just devoured when I was younger, uh, by, especially by Daniel Cohen. And I mean, why do I say this? I mean, it, it's, when I was growing up, I loved, loved ghost stories. And I'm not somebody who, I don't believe in ghosts uh, now. I mean, I certainly did when I was younger. Um, but every ghost story, all right, every haunting story that you kind of come across, or at least most, not every, uh, there's a history lesson somewhere in there. Um, there is generally, you know, if you watch a movie, there's people investigating what exactly is going on. Who was this ghost? What happened to them? Um, in movies, you know, everything from The Uninvited to... Uh, Legend of Hell House or The Changeling, um, <laughs> Sixth Sense, uh, there's always some kind of investigative element to try and figure out why the ghost is there and how do we appease them. Um, and in that, there's just history lessons. Uh, and especially in these books, I mean, I read a lot of these things growing up, but these are the ones that really stood out to me. And it's because it actually will give you a history lesson in there. It goes through, like here's uh, that, it says... Uh, miners' huts in Pennsylvania in the 19th century. So even as I was a kid, I was getting these things. It was like a, a woodcut. Um, we have uh, photos of admirals that we're talking about. Uh, here's images of German U-boats. Um, you know, uh, even uh, you know, uniforms of British soldiers um, in 1807. So with all of these ghost stories you would also get a little history lesson in there. And um, I just, I love that. Um, here are the remains of like uh, jet liners and uh, just trying to see some other things like, you know, a photo of a possible woman who might've been a certain ghost who was sighted. Um, and you don't have to believe in the ghost stories in order to get a certain valuable lesson from them. Um, even today, 
if I go to a new city, especially a small American city, not necessarily the huge ones, but small American cities, like if I go to like, uh, like a, you know, um, Newport, Rhode Island, or something like that, one of the first things I'll do uh, the first night, I'll often try to do a ghost tour. Um, and again, it's not because I believe in ghosts. It's not because I find them scary. I find them fascinating uh, because I will be taken on a tour of the city. They often take me on shortcuts and back roads that tourists often don't use, but the locals will. So I get my orientation around and they're pointing out landmarks and the stories associated with them. So I get my orientation down uh, more and I start to learn you know, you take the history with a grain of salt, but you're definitely learning about the folklore and about the certain historical events that have made a lasting impact on that place. Um, so I recommend them. Yeah, they can be very hokey. They can be very corny. Uh, but, you know, you take it in stride and um, you can actually learn a lot. So ghost stories were a real big influence in me liking history. All right. I'm also a huge horror fan and those go hand in hand. I, I don't I can't really separate the two. They've always kind of gone um, hand in hand for me. Um, in high school, uh, I did end up reading The Killer Angels, right, by, uh, Michael Shara. Um, I remember going on a family vacation and reading this in the car. It was one of those long drives. Um, but just loving it. Uh, this definitely helped to, you know, I, I think I had probably just seen, um, the movie Gettysburg, which we will, we'll get to, get to in a second. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, learning about the Battle of Gettysburg, through this, um, of course, is a classic of historical fiction, uh, and I think it's still a great way to uh, to experience uh, the Civil War. So that was a, a real big one for me as well. I also had a kids book that hopefully I still have. I'll have to look in my my library. Uh, it was called The Long Road to Gettysburg. Um, I think it's designed for uh, late kind of middle grade. Um, when my son's a little bit older, I'll I'll share that one with him. But that was about. Um, two boys, um, one on the Union side, one on the Confederate side at the Battle of Gettysburg. And I remember just looking through the photos in that book and uh, really becoming quite fascinated. Um, movies, there were tons of movies growing up. Uh, I do have some other props for that. Um, movies that had a big impact on me uh, in order to feed my love, <laughs> my love of history, um, an early one. I remember seeing this uh, I think I'm pretty sure I saw it in the theater for my seventh birthday and uh <laughs> Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure um you know now a trilogy thankfully uh the third part came out in the you know last year and I, I I adore these these films um they have a lot of heart um there are certain lessons to be learned yes is the history great no it is certainly not but I can watch this with my son and he can get at least a sense of <clears throat> like uh Joan of Arc of Genghis Khan of Abraham Lincoln uh and what they are, they're, they're good conversation pieces. Um, they're good starters for history. And I, it certainly had an effect on me when I was seven. You know, when I was right around my son's age, even a little bit younger. I loved this. Uh, again, other movies that came out um, when I was a little bit older. Um, you had Gettysburg, two-parter. I know Peg mentioned this one as well uh, on her tag. Um, I think it's part, maybe a recommendation. I think she might have had him there. And yeah, uh, is it is it a, an amazing movie? No, it's not. <laughs> it has problems. Uh, there's definitely some bad beards in here. Um, some, you know, I mean, by bad I mean fake. Um, but somebody can watch this. Uh, this fairly bloodless. Um, yeah, I think Peg criticized that uh, that the battles weren't realistic because of how absolutely bloodless a lot of the fighting was. Uh, but you will still get a good sense of of kind of at least themes of the war, um, of the two sides. You know, my, my son has been, um, curious about the civil war. We just read a book, um, one of the I survived books, I survived the battle of Gettysburg. And I started showing him this film because again, it's, it's not bloody. Um, and I think they say damn a few times. That's about it. Uh, and he's really gotten into it. Um, it's, it's gives him great visualizations in order to, uh, to understand the war. And it definitely did that to me as well. And I have to say, even, you know, every time I watch it, you know, I, of course I could pick it apart, but every time Jeff Daniels is, um, Chamberlain screams bayonets, I still get very giddy. <laughs> um, just really quickly, other ones, uh, Dances with Wolves, um, you know, for that master matter, uh, Kevin Costner, um, you know, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Is that good medieval history? No, but as a kid, it'll definitely feed an interest in history. And this helped to give me certain lessons about Native Americans. Um, you know, this is one of the few depictions at that time, at that time that Native Americans were not depicted as, as villains. Um, and that definitely left a big impression on me. 
uh, Glory, another one that I saw fairly young. Um, yeah, I still love this film. I still think it's a great one. Um, and this one is actually still sealed, but Young Guns. <laughs> uh, again, this one came out when I think I, I was seven years old. Um, I used to watch this one over and over again when I was younger. I really liked it. And uh, Braveheart made a big impact on me. And that was, um, that came, I think, when I was a freshman in high school. Uh, and I definitely went to the Renaissance Fair wearing kilts and woad. Um, terribly, historically inaccurate. Uh, but definitely made a big impact on me when I was younger. And in terms of places that had an effect on me um, to help generate my, my love of history, um, I was very fortunate in having uh, parents that always made it a point to have a a family vacation every summer and uh we, we never we didn't go terribly far uh you know we i grew up in connecticut still live in connecticut uh it was almost always in the northeast or the east coast but wherever we went uh there was always some kind of historical element that we would visit um we used to go up to lake george a lot uh we go to fort william henry um we still love that seeing the cannons go off um mystic seaport in connecticut it's always uh you know a great a great way to experience um uh you know certain uh um nautical history <laughs> i was losing the word for a second there um <clears throat> and even when i was a kid like we went to, to gettysburg and places like that uh so it, i was definitely fortunate in that situation um the next question is well-trodden path what is your favorite historical recommendation book place movie uh it's kind of difficult to say um, you know, a book, I mean, certainly Killing Angels, um, I think is, is a good place to start, uh, for the Civil War. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I'm really passionate about is horror studies and horror history. And this is one that I usually recommend to people who want to dive into something like that. Um, and that's David J. Skull's The Monster Show, A Cultural History of Horror. And he goes through, uh, it's mostly, um, um, American horror cinema uh, is the main focus up through like the 1980s. Um, I think it was originally published in the 90s. Uh, but this is in many ways um, kind of a gateway drug when it comes to horror studies. Uh, if you want to learn about the, you know, the, the historical context and the cultural context of different horror films and um, different pieces of horror media in the 20th century, I think this is a great one. Um, and like I said, it, it, it'll completely whet your appetite um, to uh, to continue diving in. Um, if this doesn't, then it's just not for you, <laughs> is what I would say. Um, so big recommendations as far as horror history, horror studies, uh, is The Monster Show. Uh, written in a very, very approachable, um, in a very approachable style. Um, but yeah, this is definitely one that I often will recommend to people. Um, as far as places... Uh, historical recommended places. Uh, in the United States, one of my favorites is um, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I, I do, um, I've been there a few times and, you know, I love walking through the, they have the cobblestone streets, um, on these quiet back streets. Uh, you, you can take a ferry to Fort Sumter. Um, these, there's old stately mansions uh, in the, in the old quarter. Um, I remember one tour guide, um, described it as homes for the chronically wealthy. Uh, but yeah, they're good restaurants and everything else too. Um, I always love going down to Charleston. It's, there's something very immersive about that place, um, with, with the history and of course a, a dark history in a lot of ways. Uh, but so much of it is so very well preserved. Um, like right in the center, there's a, a John C. Calhoun's grave is there. So you can go and pay your contempt to him if you want. Um, so that's one of my favorite spots in the U.S. I really love Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, outside of the U.S., um, yeah, one of my favorite spots is uh, is Rome. Uh, my wife and I went there for our honeymoon, and we stayed at a hotel that was maybe a five-minute walk tops from the Pantheon. So every evening, we would just walk down to the Pantheon. we get, you know, some pizza, some gelato, and we would sit down, and we would just people watch and talk and uh, you know, in that square in the Pantheon, um, it's the, the only, you know, basically Roman building that's still in continuous use, um, used as a place of worship, what it was originally used for. Uh, and you just feel like you're the center of the universe there. You know, they say all roads lead to Rome. And I think in that spot, you feel it. 
you, know, you feel that that's true. Um, so yeah, that's that was one of our definitely one of our favorite spots. Um, and just as a another spot that really um, always stuck with me, uh, that not many people I'm sure go to. But if you ever make it to Eastern Europe, or you know, or at least as far as Hungary, um, one of my favorite spots was uh, Eger, uh, which is up in their wine country um, in the uh, northeastern section, kind of in the, in the hills. And uh, it, it's just a great little. You know, big town, small city, whatever you want to, however you want to define it. Uh, there's a there's a castle up on top of the mountain. Um, you you can drink the drink the wine. Um, there's a basilica. There's um, tunnels that you can take tours of. Um, it's just a really great, uh, really great area. And right next to it, there's a I think it's Bogach, which is um, hot springs. Um, so you can go there and go swim in hot springs too. Uh, so that's another recommendation if you ever go there. Um, and uh, oh, here also has the the northernmost um, Muslim minaret, uh, which I went up and I don't know if I advise I don't advise that if you're afraid of heights. Uh, <laughs> that was not an easy climb, and the thing is several hundred years old, um, and uh, did not feel safe at all when I was on it. But uh, you know, to each his own. Um, and as far as recommendations for movies, uh, you know, aside from the ones that I had just talked about. Um, Medieval. Uh, recently, I really liked um, the Outlaw King that came out on Netflix maybe about a year ago now. Uh, about Robert the Bruce. I thought that did an excellent job with medieval arms, armor, battle tactics. Uh, very good. I mean, there, there's one duel in the very beginning that wasn't very realistic. Um, using sharp blades, as the duel that wouldn't have happened. But otherwise, um, <clears throat> a very good representation of medieval warfare. I thought uh, uh, John Adams. That series, I think, is terrific. Uh, great look at the Founding Fathers in that era. Um, a wonderful attention to historical detail. I really like that series. Um, you got Ken Burns' Civil War, which is, you know, it's old now, but, man, I still think it's compelling and effective. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, more recent one, you got uh, Lincoln, um, which Daniel Day-Lewis, just his depicting, uh, his embodiment of that figure is just amazing. And, uh... Another great one, historically, I think, is uh, Master and Commander. Um, I really love this one. Uh, you know, maybe the, the story itself isn't entirely as realistic, but um, the depictions of this kind of Napoleonic age uh, at sea is, is really stellar. Um, and one that, you know, I should have grabbed, a, should have grabbed my Blu-ray of it, um, that people don't always think about, and again, I'm going back to horror, and that's The Witch. Uh, Robert Eggers uh, came out in 2016. Um, you know, yeah, you don't have to believe in witches in order to learn some history there, because the historical attention to detail is astounding in that film. Uh, you you will understand the mind of, you know, a, a Puritan <laughs> of the, um, you know, the early 1600s, uh, at least what they thought about witches and what they feared, and, um, you know, the, the certain uh, pressures of Calvinism and how that all played out, and uh, it, that is an astoundingly... Um, good film as far as uh putting a lens into history and kind of seeing these people on their own terms and seeing something that they feared in the way that they feared it uh so again you don't have to believe in witches in order to to see that um so i highly recommend that um third question is good boots what is your favorite historical fashion era um you can see by what i'm wearing i don't think of fashion all that much uh, not that I don't appreciate it historically. Uh, one of the kind of YouTube rabbit holes that I've gone down over the past year is uh, dress historians. Um, they're all, all the ones that I've seen so far have been women. Uh, but, you know, I don't care about dresses necessarily, but they're excellent windows into women's history. Um, stuff that I don't generally come across in reading. Um, and they've provided kind of a balance from some of my history intake on YouTube, at least. Um, but as far as a uh, fashion for for males, um, you know, uh, I do like that kind of like Viking Norse aesthetic, um, hence the beard and, <laughs> uh, you know, if I don't have to shave, I, I love that. Um, you know, that kind of goes to you know, if I couldn't do Viking, it would be the the kind of Civil War era beards, um, the the golden age of facial hair. Uh, you know, I, I I doubt that many women would appreciate that, but I would totally want to bring that back. Um, and fashion, you know, clothing wise, um, if I'm not going to wear a Viking tunic and stuff and, uh, you know, have gelling and not work all over me, um, then just, you know, 
this isn't gonna be popular, but give me the 90s. Loose fitting jeans, a flannel shirt. Um, yeah, I, I'm totally fine uh, with that. Um, so yeah, probably probably not the, the most popular answers for that one. Um, the fourth question, close to home. What is a historical read set in your home country? No, I'm in the US. I mean, you could take your pick. So instead of home country, I'm just thinking close to kind of like my hometown. Um, and I have a couple examples uh, for at least my area. Uh, some that people might have actually grown up reading. Um, so one that actually took place in my hometown uh, is The Courage of Sarah Noble. Okay. Um, by, I don't know if I'm covering the name, yeah, Alice Daglish. Uh, originally written in the 50s um, about the first uh, permanent white settler family, uh, John Noble and his daughter Sarah, going into the town of what is today New Milford and, um, you know, building their home and uh, dealing with the the local Native Americans. And uh, I think there's been a lot of controversy about this book, um, about the depiction of Native Americans, although I think there's a lot of presentism going on uh, in reading it that way, because really it's about Sarah overcoming those preconceived notions and prejudices and finding that the Native Americans are actually pretty good people and very, very helpful. Um, so anyway, uh, this is one that I grew up because it was my hometown. So certainly one that I knew about. And I recently read it with my son. And I think that when the weather gets better, I might kind of uh, take him around town to some of the different spots. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll take a, a camera along and uh, bring you guys too. Uh, another one in Connecticut uh, that I remember growing up, um, hearing about, and then eventually reading. Uh, my brother Sam is dead. Uh, Revolutionary War. Um, about kind of family with divided loyalties, um, how the revolution was tearing apart a community and a family. Um, it's still pretty decent, you know, decent uh, work of historical fiction uh, for this. And um, just as another recommendation, this is not necessarily hometown, but uh, New England. Um, if people are from New England or they want to learn more about it, this is one of my favorite books about the area. Uh, it's Changes in the Land. Indians, Colonists, and the Ecology of New England uh, by William Cronin, who uh, has since gone on to some excellent scholarship. Um, and he originally wrote this in the early 80s, I think when he was still um, doing his PhD at Yale. Um, so there's a lot of references, the fact that he was Yale, a lot of references to uh, Connecticut, to my home state. But really it's about how the ecology of New England changed during the colonial era. Um, you know, just completely, you know, between trees and farming and um, it, it helped me kind of, you know, when I take walks, especially in the woods or drive around the landscape, it helped me to understand what I was seeing and what, what I would have seen, uh, before whites, um, okay, came through, um, and changed everything. Uh, I'm definitely due for a reread. It's been a while since I read it, but I remember really being impressed by this. So, um, that, I'm going to throw this in as a recommend, as a, um, a book about my area. <laughs> okay. Um, number five is trails not taken. What historical areas do you avoid? Um, I mean, I had seen, uh, Bill Rutenberg over at, uh, the Rutenberg library say this and, uh, you know, Peg had something very similar, but super recent history. Um, yeah, I, I do think that it tends to be way too polemic and political, um, to really have any kind of objective look in the past. You need more time to go by it. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of agree with their answers, uh, anything within the last 20 years. And, um, I do also, I, I am conscious of trying to stay away from, uh, histories of war that glorify the war. Um, I, th I think that war is absolutely hideous <laughs> and, uh, you know, if it should be avoided if possible, um, you know, only on extreme circumstances should we resort to something like that. Uh, but I don't, I don't like the glorification of war necessarily. Um, so it's not that I will totally avoid it, but I will be very cautious and reluctant to pick something like that up. Um, and the sixth question, um, trail map, what historical reads are on your TBR? Uh, well, I'm just began, this is be a primary source reading, um, 12 years of slave by Solomon Northrup. Uh, so, you know, learning about the, the slave trade and slave experience, um, from somebody who experienced it firsthand in the mid 1800s. Uh, so that's one that I'm reading right now. And then I do very, very soon after that plan to, uh, 
continue my studying of aspects of Japanese history. Uh, I'm going to read um, The Rape of Nanking by Iris Chang and The Knights of Bushido, uh, A History of Japanese War Crimes During World War II by Lord Russell of Liverpool. Uh, so I do want to understand that aspect of Japanese history a little bit more. And these are two that I happen to be able to get. And uh, I'll be diving into those fairly soon, I think. Um, pioneers, what historical person inspires you? That's a difficult one. I'm not somebody who really has heroes. Um, you know, it, I think the founding fathers as a group inspire me. Um, of course, completely, uh, you know, <laughs> um, understanding all of their, their downfalls and their shortcomings, which are absolutely numerous. Um, but also how forward looking and how optimistic they were in certain ways. Uh, you know, like somebody like, like Thomas Jefferson, of course, you know, there's so many negatives to him, but there's also so much that I find inspiring. Um, Thomas Paine, uh, you know, is kind of a, a person of the world and how passionate he was, even though he, he died basically hated and uh, his, his graveside attended by hardly anybody, um, mostly because of things that he had said about criticizing religion uh, at the time. But, uh, you know, what an incredible person. Um, you know, Benjamin Franklin, a lot of these guys I find inspiring in ways. Um, and I think learning about them is inspiring. Uh, even if not one in particular, I find inspiring. Uh, one person that I guess kind of inspires me that I keep going back to their books and now they're a historical figure, uh, <laughs> which wouldn't have been the case necessarily, you know, too long ago in the large scheme of things. That would be Carl Sagan. Um, died unfortunately of cancer in the 90s but uh he's somebody that I continually return to in his writings and I do find that inspirational um his views on uh, on the world um uh, science's place uh within society um and how he would infuse history with um with science with um kind of I think hopeful notions of mankind uh so yeah, I, I guess I kind of throw Carl Sagan as somebody who does inspire me, and I guess he'd be considered a historical character, um, or a historical person, I guess. The last thing is tag your fellow history nerds. Um, now, I'm, for, I'm new to YouTube. Um, I think a lot of the people who I see make history content, which isn't a lot, um, have already done this. This is an older tag that Bill Rutenberg had kind of resurrected, and he had tagged Peg because she's... She's been around for about a year, I think, on YouTube, but she hadn't done it yet. So um, I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to tag um, Jere from Finland. Uh, his channel is Drawn to Stories. Um, he is also new to BookTube. I think he's only been around for about a month. Um, he's a little bit longer than me, I think. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen him read at least historical fiction. Uh, he might also be a history fan. I'm not entirely sure, but if not, I'd love to see what he reads for historical fiction. And also I'd like to see uh, answers from somebody not in the U.S., um, from country of Finland, who, yeah, Finland, I don't know a tremendous about about the history. Uh, I do like some of the horror films from Finland. Uh, Rare Exports is um, almost a yearly watch for us around the holidays. And uh, I also liked Sauna uh, <laughs> that came out a little over a decade ago. Uh, so Finland does have some good horror films. Um, but my, my knowledge of Finland does not go too far beyond that. Uh, so anyway, if you see this, I would definitely like to, uh, hear your answers. All right. So that was the, uh, the history trail book tag. Um, I think it's went a little bit longer than I expected to, but anyhow, thanks booktube.